thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. My name is Angie Vishianen, and I am the founder of Leg Up Legal. We provide a mentoring program that connects prospective law students to lawyers for mentoring. And we started doing these meetups a few weeks ago when COVID-19 hit just to help other prospective law students bond, meet other people, feel like they're not going through all of this alone, and learn a few tips and tricks from lawyers and legal professionals that might help them navigate these challenging times. So today I have a wonderful special guest with us. Um, his name is Matthew Silver, and he is the owner of Silver Immigration, his own law firm. And he's here to talk to us today about what it takes to start your own law firm pretty close out of law school. So welcome, Matt. Can you please, you know, talk to us a little bit about what your journey was like and um, what you do in your firm? Absolutely. Well, hello to everyone who's, uh, who's tuning in and who might be watching this on a recording. Uh, before I get into this, obviously, we need to be, say a big thank you to Angie for organizing this. During these times, it's super important that, uh, that lawyers and law students are coming together and supporting each other. Um, I, I think mentorship and, and coaching and just being part of the legal community is probably more important now than ever. Uh, and I know Angie's doing a ton of these talks for, uh, for a whole variety of topics. So thank you to Angie. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, I, so I was just talking to Angie about what I wanted to sort of talk to everyone about here. And my thought was, there was a few things that, uh, you know, questions, concerns, things that uh, sort of spooked me when I was considering uh, starting up a law firm, things that I wish I had known, things that I wish, uh, you know, some, somebody had sort of sat me down and, and told me about, and uh, a couple of myths that I wish would have been uh, dispelled for me. Um, so I'm sort of going to go through those because I think that uh, because they were sort of the main things that were on my mind at the time, uh, I think uh, a lot of people might have those same questions. And even if, you know, uh, you, you've got no interest in, in starting a law firm, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned in, uh, in, in sort of these things that I went through. So uh, I'm going to start by just giving you a bit about my background. I went to the University of Miami Law School. Uh, I began in 2013. Um, I imagine there's probably some prospective law students here in the group, so I would love to speak to them specifically about this, because when I uh, decided to go to law school, I was not particularly passionate uh, or particularly interested in any area of law. Um, I really went because I had finished undergrad. I, I wasn't sure what the next, you know, best move would be. Um, and when I got there, uh, I did a few things. One, uh, well, when I started, I, I thought I wanted to be a sports lawyer. So I took a sports law class, joined, joined the uh, Sports and Entertainment Society. I quickly realized that it wasn't for me when you strip down all the glamour that, that it's really not uh, <laughs> such a great way to spend your days. Uh, the next thing I convinced myself I wanted to be was a corporate lawyer because everyone wants to be a corporate lawyer at some point or another. Uh, so I took some corporate law classes and then did a... Uh, a semester with Bacardi, the alcohol company, which was great because they paid me in alcohol, <laughs> which was a nice little tidbit. But they, uh, you know, I got to learn what the day to day of a general counsel would really be like and do some transactional stuff, ultimately decided that's not for me. And then my third sort of try at figuring out what I wanted to do was bankruptcy. Took some bankruptcy classes, absolutely loved it, fell head over heels. And then did a pro bono clinic where I got to work with some individual debtors. Uh, probably the most important thing that happened to me in law school was doing that because I, I got the opportunity to work on a file where I was able to help someone who really fallen on hard times uh, discharge a pretty significant amount of debt. Learned very quickly the sort of value of, uh, you know, the, how important it is to have intrinsic value in the stuff that you do and you know finding a passion and uh any kind of joy in your work um so that that's sort of a lesson that i, I took with me but beyond that I, I realized that bankruptcy wasn't for me the reason why i'm going through all this is to say that if you're thinking about going to law school and you don't know exactly what kind of law you want to do 
that's not the worst thing. Law school teaches you a lot of things. It all, but it also, it teaches you what you don't want to do. So you're going to have opportunities to try a whole whack of different areas of law. Um, so it doesn't, it's not the biggest deal if you don't know exactly what kind of lawyer you want to be. And I'm so glad that you're actually saying that. Um, I think it is actually really important for students to kind of hear the stories of how a lot of people go through this. And, you know, not all of us had it all figured out, right? Huh. Um, so I, I think it's great that you're saying that, you know, we do try to get students a lot of exposure to lots of different areas of law by doing meetups like this, by also, you know, having them participate in the mentoring program, because I think while um, you kind of can figure it out while you're in law school, it's also a lot of money to be paying for an education. And if, you know, you kind of take, take your time trying to figure out what it is and you don't get the job that you want on the other side, it might not be as worth it for people. Um, but I'm glad that, you know, you can share your candid story about, you know, yeah. hey, I kind of thought, didn't know what I wanted to do and tried a couple things, figured out that didn't work, pivoted again. Yeah, um, it, 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 it's important to understand that most people don't really have a linear path um, yeah. and that there is some trial and error to it. You know, just because you decide that you want to go to law school, there's a million different kinds of lawyer that you could be, you know, so there's like I said, there's an element of, uh, of trial and error that I think is really important. And I would encourage anyone who's actually in law school right now to get involved as much as you can. Do moot court, do law review, join clubs, associations, internships, like as much uh, exposure to different areas of law you could get, the better. And, and you'll be able to sort of narrow your focus. Um, what, what, what I did after Miami, I did, uh, I moved to Toronto, spent a year out there. Um, and just, I assume I'm speaking to a, a group of Americans. What happens in <laughs> Canada, you got to do 10 months of what's called articling, which is basically you're an apprentice uh, before you could practice law. So then my first job out of law school uh, was relatively short. It was less than a year, but 11 months. It was a fantastic job. I love the people I worked for. It was really just the best experience ever. I enjoyed what I was doing. I was getting paid pretty well. And what area of law was, was that? that it you was immigration law. It okay. was immigration law. And I, you know, I ultimately decided that I wanted to go out on my own, which is a very tough decision when you're sort of in a very good spot. Ultimately decided that I wanted to do it. And, you know, the, the immediate feedback that I got from all, almost all of my peers universally was that you're not old enough to do it. You don't have enough, enough experience. Um, you don't know. Enough. The most common feedback that I got was your network isn't big enough. That's something that I kept hearing on and off. Um, to which I, I, I've, I've had the same approach the entire time, which is that I think the argument of sort of youth versus experience is sometimes a little bit misunderstood in the legal industry. I think that any person coming out of law school uh, really truly knows just as much as, you know, the 20 year partner, because when you're coming out of law school, fresh out of law school, you're an expert at learning the law. No one is better at the skill of learning law than you. So it might take you a little bit longer than maybe the senior partner to figure out the answer to something, but you, you really have top notch spe specifically, you have top notch legal skills, but specifically legal research skills. So I, I always thought um, in terms of the substantive stuff that, uh, you know, youth is too, too often uh, undervalued and that, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, the younger person with maybe not as much experience will probably be willing to work a little harder and have a little bit more drive and determination. So, you know, I, I was, I was pretty quickly uh, able to dismiss a lot of the uh, sort of the criticisms that I was getting and uh, the people who sort of doubted my path in that regard. So, you know, for, for, for people who may or may not be considering, you know, taking a leap, like starting your own firm, if their main concern is, well, I don't really have any experience. I don't think that that really matters. I, I, I think if you've gone through law school, you've passed the bar, that is 
uh, sufficient experience and that uh, if you really put your mind to it, you've got the care and desire that, uh, that it really can be done. Then, That's awesome. So can you talk a little bit about kind of the, the process that you went through? So, you know, after leaving the firm, you know, what are all the kind of steps that you had to do in order to launch your own firm before you could even open for business and say, I'm right. offering legal services? The, the first thing you do is you call the law society a hundred different times to make sure what you're doing is right. <laughs> is the concern, you know, is my accounting in order? Is, uh, the way I'm sending out the retainer agreement um, compliant with the law society. Uh, you, you don't want to get in trouble with any uh, state bar uh, or provincial bar uh, in, in my case because of the move. Um, so that's sort of the first thing. Most, um, I, I, I used a lot of the Florida state bars resources because I was barred in Florida and they have a great uh, young lawyers division for people start, excuse me, starting their own law firms. Um, mm -hmm. So that was sort of the real first thing that I did. And then to backtrack a little bit, one, one of my last few weeks at my firm in Toronto, I was talking with uh, the managing partner who I'd grown to be very close with. And at that point, I knew what I wanted to do. So I was kind of picking his brain. I was, how did you build it? He built this thing from scratch. It's very successful. He basically did it on his own. He said, Matt, one of the smartest things a young lawyer could do is to write a book. I said, what do you mean? He said, I wrote a book right out of law school and it instantly gave me a uh, credibility that I wouldn't otherwise have. I was instantly impressed that he had done that because I, I had no idea. I went home, Googled it. Turns out he wrote a book. It did very well. Um, so one of the first things I did was I knew that setting up the firm was going to take a couple of months. I knew that before I laid down the strategy and the business plan, I was going to like, think about every decision 10 different ways. It was going to be a bit of a process for me. And it was also going to be a process before I got my first few clients. So I, I took that time to write a book. Uh, and obviously, so I'm in immigration, I'm an immigration lawyer. So I wrote the book about US immigration. It was very uh, uh, labor intensive and tedious. But for those people who are coming out of law school, that's what we do. We write, we cite, we research. It's it's in our DNA at that point. Um, so it, the book did exactly what I wanted to do, which is that it, it established uh, me within the industry and gave me almost instantly credibility and opened up doors that I don't know if otherwise would have been opened. Um, so that was sort of my first, uh, my first big endeavor. And then you sort of get to the point where, okay, I've got, you know, these things happening, how do I get my first clients? That was, you know, something that sort of gave me a little pit in my stomach when I was starting this off. I don't know how I'm going to get my first clients. Who wants to hire someone with very little experience, you know, who they don't know. Um, what I found, and I've spoken to many people I went to law school with who had started up firms right out of law school. And it seems to be universally the case that unfortunately the answer is you're going to have to do a little bit of work for free at the beginning which isn't ideal and it kind of takes the wind out of your sails and no one wants to work for free, it sucks. <laughs> but it's, it's necessary for a few things. One, and by the way, any law student who's watching this knows they get hit up for like free law advice every single day by everyone they've ever known. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just part of the gig. But yeah, so when you start doing some stuff for free, you're gonna to start to establish a reputation for doing good work and for being you know, quick and respectful, especially with your customer service. That's something that the legal industry sort of misses. Lawyers sometimes get off on their high horse and they think, oh, I could take three or four days to respond to someone. Nobody likes it. You gotta respond quickly. You've gotta be diligent with all your stuff. So once you build up a reputation for that, the clients start to come. So for me, what had happened was there's an accountant uh, based in Montreal who I had done a couple of favors for. He called me and asked me a few things, relatively small projects over a couple of months. And I always knocked it out of the park, did it very quick and, and very purposeful. And then he called me up one day, said, hey, Matt, I've got this client. And it was my first real client. And it was the first client that I could charge money for. And it was 
wildly exciting and thankfully it was my first win and it absolutely made all of the you know the the headaches and the obstacles and the things that you go to well worth it it's uh it, it, it's, it's an incredible feeling when you, your wins are your own uh it's certainly different feeling you know as opposed to being in a firm uh and that sort of goes back to you know the point i was making before about having something driving you intrinsically you know i, I like my job because i get to help people but i also get to enjoy the wins um which is something also that I think is a little overlooked. Um, there's a, there's, I, sorry, I have here a list of a couple of other things that were sort of uh, on my mind when I sort of started this endeavor. And I, and I have here what to do when you don't know the answer, which is, <laughs> you know, uh, I, again, something that uh, was, was sort of sitting in the pit of my stomach when, when I was thinking about doing this, because as a, you know, uh, as a young lawyer, not having the answer is the scariest thing ever. So what do you do? Um, it's also very regular, right? I mean, right. as a young it, lawyer, it's like everything it's you see part is of it. yeah. It's part of it, but also not having the safety net of being able to walk across the hall to the senior partner and say, could you just help me with this? Right. Um, makes it all seem a little more, uh, you know, the stakes seem a little higher, at, at least to me they did. So. Practically, I, you know, I, one of the first things I did was I bought, you know, three or four of the best textbooks I could find um, because I personally hate doing legal research on the computer, even though sometimes you have to. Um, textbooks are your friend. Not everything has to be uh, online. But I did get into a situation, it was probably four or five months into starting up. Client calls me up and it's a very good client and said, Matt, I need a green card. I said, okay, great. She spoke for 20 minutes and she told me everything that was going on with her case. This case was well above anything that I had ever handled. Um, it probably had 15 issues in there that I, I, I didn't know really what to do with. So I said, I'll, I'll call you tomorrow and let you know what, uh, what the plan is. And I thought, and I really thought about it and gave it a, you know, a lot of consideration. Ultimately, what I ended up doing was I called my old boss in Toronto. I said, hey, look, I've got this file. It's for a very good amount of money. I could use this money because I'm starting up my own firm. This is a very important thing for me to have, but it's in the client's best interest that someone like you handle it and not me. So I ended up having to refer it out, which, you know, not to hammer this point too much, losing a well-playing client at the beginning is tough. It really is tough, but you, you, you always have to have the client's best interest at heart and another thing that i've noticed not to say too many things about like bad things about the typical you know 20 year partner kind of thing is i think that as lawyers progress in their career they get less and less ethical because they've seen so much and they've been around the block so much and they've sort of gotten used to or maybe numb to uh sort of the the gray areas i think the most ethical people in, in the world is the first year associate because he in, in law school, they'll tell you every terrible, you know, ethics horror story about how someone made a mistake and everything went terrible. And you also just wrote an ethics exam. So all the laws are, you know, fresh in your mind. Um, so that was a situation where, you know, ethically, uh, I believe I did the right thing and it all worked out. The client was happy. Uh, I was able to maintain, you know, a good relationship with my old boss, which is always important. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, you, your reputation is, it more than just precedes you, it, it's the foundation of your entire business when you're starting out, um, because it's all anyone has to go off of. So, you know, you, you, you can't shortchange yourself, you can't, you can't cut corners. And uh, like I said, you, you, you got to act in the client's best interest, even if it's contrary to yours, because that's, that, that, that's the duty. That's, uh, that's what we signed up for, basically. But I think that it's great that you had somebody that you could, you know, refer the work out to, that you had a good relationship with other people in the profession. I think that's what's really important is knowing that 
even if you're a junior lawyer and you're starting your own firm and you don't know a single soul in the profession, you know, you can go to bar associations, you can join young lawyer divisions like Matt said. So almost every state bar association, you know, the, um, Florida Bar Association or Texas Bar Association or any of the states, they'll have a young lawyers division generally. And those are mainly targeted to people who are fresh out of law school mm -hmm. or very close out of law school to help you with some of these issues. And they can connect you to more experienced practitioners, right? So if you, if you feel like you're in over your head, mm -hmm. you know, there are resources that you can go to. You don't have to feel like you have to bite off more than you can chew, right? A a absolutely. And which is why, I I again, I, I think sort of talks like this are, are so important. And, and it certainly, certainly seems, well, just sort of necessity at this point that, uh, you, you know, a lot of networking events are sort of moving online for, for obvious reason these, these days. But I think it makes it more, you know, oddly enough, I, I think it makes it more personal and it makes it easier to sort of attend a networking event um, and, and easier to reach out to, uh, you know, someone you think uh, might be able to be a mentor or a coach. And, and really what I, I've experienced is just about every time I've ever reached out to uh, someone with a little more experience than me to ask for help, assistance, guidance, or just a chat for a coffee. People say yes. People love tr want, love helping uh, law students. It's Well, because we've all been through it before, right? Yeah. We know how hard it is. We know. Yeah, it's, it's like a fraternity sorority kind of thing where we all are sort of bonded by this unique experience of law school, which is its own world and you know we we feel for each other we want to support each other so it you know i think now more than ever is a time to just you know hop on linkedin and see oh this person's in you know corporate law and in the city excuse me that i want to be in let me just add him and see if i could hop on a phone call because i think more than ever people are willing to say yes to stuff like that Thank you so much for saying that. I've been trying to convince everybody to do that. And actually, shameless plug, we had a video on how to do that, how to reach out to lawyers on LinkedIn a few weeks ago. So go check it out. Um, we had a meetup exactly on that topic. So thank you so much for saying that. that that's fantastic. And, and, and I still do it too. I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll add people on, on LinkedIn who I think are in interesting practice areas or who are in my practice area, um, but might be have different, uh, different area of expertise that I might be able to bounce ideas off of. Um, the other thing when you're starting out, professional organization. So I'm part of uh, AILA, which is uh, American and Immigration Lawyers Association. And they have a mentor directory. So, you, you know, you're stuck on a substantive issue, go through the directory, and you could just pick a mentor and you could speak with them instantly. Uh, a lot of these organizations have this, whatever your field of choice is, you know, you, you find out what the, the main national organization is for it. They will have resources. They will be able to connect you with people, people who are, who have said that they want to help. Um, so, so I, I think that's sort of, uh, that's invaluable too. Matt, can I ask you a little bit more about kind of the nuts and bolts of starting your own practice? How long do you think from kind of thinking about you wanting to start this till you actually opened your doors, what was the amount of time that it took you to get all your ducks in a row? It's about three months. Um, okay. Pretty fast. And, and, and it was three months because, well, there's, there, there's not a lot that time-wise, I mean, technically, if someone graduates law school and they want to do it, there's not that much stopping them from doing it really next week but there's certain things that you want to plan out, right? Um, you want to put pen to paper and have uh, a really solid business plan because w without that kind of guidance, you're just sort of going to be floating around and you're not going to know really what to do. Now in putting together the business plan, I heavily, heavily relied on my network that I built in law school, which is one of the, probably one of the biggest cliches I've ever heard is uh, is that your law that your law career begins the first day of law school? You show up to law school and everyone says that, right? It's like, oh, you got your reputation starts now. This this is the beginning, and it's a cl cliche because it's true. And you know, I, I you never really know where these people are going to end up, right? You're going to be going to school with 
future judges, federal litigators, people who are building policy. Um, I actually have a funny story. When I was first year law school, I was doing oral, oral arguments. It was me and my buddy against two girls. And I thought that we did pretty good. You know, I was, I was really happy about it. Um, turns out the girl who was leading the team against me, uh, she turned out to be the press secretary for the White House. <laughs> yeah, her name's Kaylee McEnany. If you turn on any news channel, any day of the week, you will see her. Um, so you, you, you really don't know where these people are going to end up and they could become some of the most powerful people in the country. So it, 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 it's important to sort of carry yourself with a certain level of professionalism and respect and, and, and all that. And then personally for me, when I was starting my law firm, uh, you know, so one of my closest friends in law school was, you know, one of the best business minds that I ever met. And I, I called him up uh, just about every day and was asking him questions, uh, you know, business questions, but substantive too. And he would, you know, go back and forth with me about my ideas. And he was, uh, he was fantastic. But, you know, if I needed to pay for a consultant like that, it would have cost me a fortune. But because he's my friend from law school, I call him, he'll sit on the phone with me for a half hour a day. So your network in law school uh, really can't be understated. It's one of, uh, it's almost worth the price of admission. It really is. I, I, I have so many uh, friends from law school doing incredible things um, who I could reach out to for a, a number of different favors uh, at a moment's notice. So uh, be friendly, make friends in law school, but, uh, and have fun. Don't take it too seriously, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's work and it's kind of like a job. So you kind of got to treat it like a job. Can you talk about kind of some of the matters that you handle now? What does your day-to-day -day look like at an immigration firm and what type of immigration do you mostly work on? What matters? <laughs> Sure. So I do U.S. business immigration. So my typical client is someone, a Canadian based in Montreal, Toronto, uh, Vancouver, who's going to be moving to New York, L.A. Uh, or Buffalo or something like that. Uh, so what we do is we would get them the, their, uh, their visa or their green card to go and work into the States. Uh, we do some corporate immigration too. So bigger companies who need as Canadian companies that need to establish themselves uh, somewhere in the States, we'll help them out with that. Uh, in terms of the day to day, being an immigration lawyer is a lot like sort of being a therapist in, in that <laughs> people are sort of, a typical client's a very nervous person because there's a lot on the line, right? They want to change countries. They got a new job opportunity maybe they've got a spouse in the states these are high stakes these are no one's coming to me on a whim so it's usually someone who's very uh has a lot invested so i spend a lot of time on the phone just talking to clients my 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 day you know i have to allocate a couple hours a day just to that and i don't mind doing that i i actually like uh you know talking to clients and, and playing that role uh, the other part of the day is spent drafting documents uh, and communicating with, uh, you know, different U.S. agencies, whether it be the board or USCIS, something like that, to sort of handle a problem case. Now, Corona has wildly changed the immigration landscape. Um, surprisingly, though, right now, uh, the U.S. border is still adjudicating matters, so I could still send people to the border for visas but all the other offices actually in the country and all the consulates, all of that stuff is closed. Do you so find the work has slowed down? The type of, it, the work hasn't exactly slowed down. It's just the type of my work has changed. It's, a, I'm unfortunately now dealing with a lot of people who have lost jobs and now have to leave wherever they are. Um, so I'm, I'm a little less busy, but definitely still busy. And it's just busy with different type of work. Uh, unfortunately not very inspiring kind of stuff. Most people are going through hard times and, and sort of need some help, uh, you know, maneuvering that, figuring out where, where they want to live. A lot of people have found themselves in, you know, I call it visa limbo, where you're sort of between visas and it's not really clear, you know, what you're allowed to do. Um, so my, my days become a lot more, uh, a lot more research um, and 
less applications, but uh, we're, we're still busy. We're still plugging away. And, um, and is all of your practice like pretty much, you know, is it transactional work? Do you do anything where you go and appear before a tribunal? Um, you know, what is that like? Are you mostly in your office doing paperwork? Like what, what is that like? I'm, I, I'm either meeting with clients or uh, putting together paperwork. So the way the U.S. immigration set up is that, you know, everything's either mailed in uh, or given in by hand. Uh, very rarely do people litigate. It happens. Um, people do get uh, bad decisions and go to federal court. Uh, it hasn't come across my desk. To be honest, I would love to go to federal court. I think that sounds <laughs> like a great time. I think it would be really fun to do. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity. And you need the specific kind of case. You really need the facts behind you to be confident enough to say, all right, this is the one I'm taking to court. You know, me versus the U.S. government, let's go. Uh, you, you really you need the facts behind you. You can't take sort of a, a mild kind of case. Uh, so my day-to-day -day is... Yeah, a lot of drafting, a lot of reviewing. Um, I think, you know, I, I meet with clients as often. As, you, obviously, now you can't, but preceding Corona, I would meet with all of my clients face to face at least once, um, and then hopefully twice. So once at the beginning to do the intake, and once at the end when everything's sort of finishing up. Uh, it creates uh, an element of trust. It builds the relationship. People appreciate you taking the time to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, obviously now I'm doing a lot more Zoom calls than uh, actual meetings and handing off documents or signatures has become a whole mess. Um, you know, FedEx and UPS will do something every other day. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's basically it, mostly uh, in my office. And how much did it cost, do you think, to start up your own firm? How did you find the funds? I mean, like if you're, well, you said you did work before going in, so you might have yeah. had some money there. So uh, I had a few bucks saved up. You, you have to be incredibly, one, you've got to be fiscally conservative starting out. There's no two ways about it. Um, you can't waste a penny. Uh, there's just no two ways about it. And anything that you could do on your own, you can't pay anyone for it. So, so simple stuff like uh, managing social media, running a blog, um, that's stuff that the solo practitioner has to do. You can't outsource stuff like that. Um, Find a law I, student. <laughs> that, that's what I did. I, I took on, uh, I took on uh, a few law students at the beginning, which was, uh, you know, a, a real savior uh, because they would draft applications and instead of doing all the legwork, I could spend time reviewing and, and doing business development. So uh, taking on law students at the beginning is great. It's also a really unique experience for law students because instead of doing maybe photocopying and sort of lower level kind of work that they would do at a big firm, they are in the trenches doing, you know, real hands-on stuff uh, that they might not get the opportunity to do otherwise. So uh, I, and I spoke very candidly with, with the students that I had, uh, you know, at the beginning. And, and I do think that they got sort of a, a really beneficial, unique um, experience from the whole thing. And, you, you know, because when you're starting out, you might not have, you know, a, a lot of money or backing behind you. When you do start, you know, financially doing okay, the small things end up being the biggest things in the world, right? Like, so I, I remember, you know, I had a couple of wins. I said, okay, I'm going to buy an expensive photocopier that is like the most exciting thing in the world for a young lawyer <laughs> who now awesome. scanning and photocopying is now an easy thing to do. Uh, that <laughs> it sounds silly, but that was like one of the biggest days I've had when I, when I was able to afford a really good scanner. Um, but yeah, you got to, uh, you know, ho hopefully you've got a few bucks saved up and you could sort of use whatever resources you have. Uh, I started out working from home. Uh, I was using my cell phone as my main line. Um, I, uh, another, you know, bit of a savior was I had my younger brother who's sort of, uh, you know, a, a marketing SEO uh, website guru. He was able to, you know, help me out. So you got to, you got to lean on the people around you. You can't be afraid to ask for help and support. You're probably not going to be able to do it all on your own. 
uh, and again, this is where your network comes in and, and your reputation, because if, if you're good to people and, and you're helpful, uh, people are, are more than willing to, uh, to sort of return the favor. So, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly had a lot of help uh, in the beginning getting things going, for sure. And how much time do you think you spend a week working? I mean, I think we hear a lot about the larger firms and how much time all those lawyers end up working a week. And, you know, anybody who's gone to big law likes to complain about their billable hours. But I think it's, it's nice having your own firm because you get the freedom, right? So how much time do you like to spend working on matters during the week? For sure. Well, I... This is absolutely you, you. You hit on definitely the biggest benefit uh, of the whole the whole concept, which is that the work life work life balance is great and it's flexible, and you could you can make it work for you. So, for me personally, I actually really like working on the weekends. I like working on the weekends because it's unlikely any of my clients are going to email me, and it's just completely uninterrupted time. Um, so I personally like coming in on the weekends and and. Uh, putting in full days. Uh, and then it all depends. You have to be comfortable with the sort of ups and downs and the flows of it, because there's going to be weeks where the phone just isn't ringing that much and you're just not that busy and you have to, you know, be comfortable enough and confident, you know, in your plan and strategy to know that, okay, it's a slow week. It's not a lot of work coming in, but I know that, you know, it's going to come back. And then there's going to be some times where you're going to have to work all night and all weekend and it's going to be just uh, absolutely ridiculous. Um, that being said, you can't compare it to big law because big law, that sort of absolutely ridiculous, you know, 15 hour days is the norm. I mean, I, mm -hmm. most of my friends are, my peers are at big law and they can't wait to complain and tell me how many hours they put in a day. Uh, so it does happen where I'll have to sort of work through the night or work, you know, a, a few crazy days back to back hours, but it, it's not the norm and you can make it work for you. So, you know, if, if you've got personal stuff where, you know, and, you know, I, I really don't want to go to work Friday because I've got, you know, uh, a, an important lunch with a buddy that I want to go to or, or, or something like that. You've got that flexibility, um, which is, it, it's so comforting and so nice to have. So I, uh, I take advantage of it when I can, but you, you have to know and be ready for the, for those days where it, it's just going to come in and it, it's going to feel like it's too much. And, you know, you, you, you've got to sort of push through. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. I guess um, before we open it up to the Q&A, do you have any other tidbits of advice for people who are either thinking about law school or currently in law school right now? I think we have both on the call right now, um, prospective and current law students. So um, any other tips of advice? The one sort of last little bit of advice that I would give you would be I would start right away uh, building up your social media presence. And specifically, L LinkedIn is the obvious one. A everyone should be active on LinkedIn. But what I found is that Twitter is also great. So if you are a prospective law student, current law student, if there's an area of law that you like, start a Twitter. Let's say you're interested in civil litigation. Every couple of days, it'll take you 30 seconds at a time. It's nothing tweet about a case that's going on in civil litigation, tweet about something that's relevant, an idea. Um, because one of two things are gonna happen. Either you're gonna start your own firm and wow, now I've got this like social media platform that I could build on. Or you're gonna go for an, in for a job interview and they're gonna say, hey, this person's been interested and you know, shown a, a real passion for this area of law for years. Um, great, and they're gonna be excited to talk to you about that. So it's, a, so it's a small, silly little thing, but uh, get on Twitter, uh, connect with other lawyers on Twitter and tweet about the, uh, the area of law that interests you because it's, it's the most low maintenance thing. It takes no time and it, it could very well prove to be uh, a great asset. Wonderful. Thank you for that advice. So I'd like to go ahead and open it up now. If anybody has questions for Matthew, please feel free to unmute yourself and jump on the video and ask away.
Hi, Matthew. Uh, I'm Adzer. I'm a prospective law student, but uh, my applications to law school were delayed due to the coronavirus. So I would like to ask you, during one of your slow weeks in your law firm where you're not getting as many clients, what do you do to stay busy and be productive during that time since you're not getting actual work? Because for me, if I'm not busy, I, I get tempted to just play video games or watch movies or shows and just kind of yeah. waste my time, you know? So what do you do to like keep enhancing your skills or Simo and, and like keep improving yourself? Um, yeah, thank you. Sure, Azra, thank you for the question. Uh, I've been doing a few different things in, in sort of this, uh, this Corona time when, uh, when things are slowing up. One is uh, I've been doing way more CLE that I need to. So for, for any prospective law students who don't know what CLE is, it's continuing legal education. Uh, whatever state bar you're a part of, you could Google it. There's a ton of resources that you could do for free. A lot of them are paid, but you can do them for free. You can uh, learn about uh, different areas of law. You could develop different kinds of skills. Um, for, for, for me personally, I have uh, I, I've been doing a lot of uh, you know different videos about employment law because it's an area of law that I'm not particularly familiar with but that always overlaps with, uh, with what I'm doing. So the more familiar I'm with, the better. Also been watching a lot of tax videos. I find uh, tax is incredibly boring, but it's important. Everyone needs to know that. Uh, the other thing that I've been doing is uh, blogging a lot more than uh, I used to and significantly longer. So it's, you know, it, it, it's exciting and satisfying to, you know, sort of give your take on, on sort of complex legal issues and delve into it. Um, but when I was, uh, when I was starting out at the beginning and, and when clients weren't coming in, how I was really filling my time was with writing the book. That's, uh, I, I think that's sort of, uh, an under, an underutilized, uh, or it, it, it's just not particularly considered by many people because it, it, it sounds like a big endeavor, but the truth is, if, if there's an area of law or, or if there's anything that sort of is particularly interesting to you that you want to analyze, you want to delve deeper into, I, I, I think writing about is great. And if you write enough that you could turn it into a book, um, it, it, it's very doable. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole wide range of publishers. There's also self publishers if you want to go that route. Um, so I would say uh, those two things, CLE videos and writing whatever you can. Right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. What other questions do we have? Anybody else? Don't be shy. Jump in. <laughs> Even if this is your first one, I think a lot of people who come and join these calls, they wait for a couple of, you know, meetups before they start engaging. But That's okay. I you can type in a fight. question. Yeah, type it in the chat. Feel free if you want to, if you don't want to turn on your video, just, or just uh, unmute your audio, whatever you want. So while other people might be thinking of their questions, I have one. <laughs> sure. So, so you said that when you ha get clients uh, for, for who's like a, a questions you don't really have answers to, you refer them to like larger firms. Yeah. But so then as you gain experience, um, how do you, build your experience so that you start um, being able to serve those clients? So I was fortunate enough in that particular instance to have a really good relationship uh, with a lawyer that I referred it to. Um, so I basically piggybacked on the file. So I didn't really do any of the work, but you know, I, I was in a position where I could learn and see what was being done through each step. And I saw it to the point where it ended up being successful. So, um, you, you know, hopefully, and, and I've made this point a couple of times, I, I think not to get repetitive, but your, your reputation, your network and your connections are, are, are just the most important thing because if you have good relationships, so keep in mind, I had quit this job, you know, a few months previously. So to basically call them up, I mean, I was helping them, they were helping me. So we we're both sort of doing each other a favor, but to be able to have that relationship was super important. So, uh, you know, hopefully your, you know, your, your network and your, uh, you know, your, your, your connections uh, put you in a position where you could, you know, 
basically have a, a, a really hands-on kind of mentor, someone who you could sort of shadow. So that's, uh, th th that's how it, uh, it worked for me. And, you know, today, if something like that came across my desk, absolutely, uh, I, I, I'm very confident that I could handle it. That's awesome. Thanks. All right, it looks like we've got some questions in the chat box here. So um, what was your biggest obstacle in starting your own firm and how did you overcome it? What would you recommend for someone pursuing that path? <laughs> Three questions in one. The biggest obstacle. Deciding to do it. That's really it because there's, uh, there's there's like a uh, there's like a myth that it sort of can't be done and that it sort of seems to seems like a, a challenge that you can't face. So to me, the hardest thing was sort of getting the courage to go ahead and do it. Um, I it, it, it took uh, a lot of um, you know a lot of talking with friends and families and, and with peers and with mentors to sort of get me to the point where I was comfortable enough to do it. Um, and then practically after that, the, the, the hardest part is, uh, it's getting those first few clients because you, you're, you're going to have to push through some hard times. You're going to have to sort of get past the, um, the uncomfortable part of, uh, of not knowing exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and, and practically how, how you get those first few clients is, uh, you, you know, it, it is ultimately by you know, to doing some work for free. Um, and when, when I say for free, it, it shouldn't mean that it's for nothing. So, you know, you do a favor for someone and you say, hey, you know, could you get, leave me a good Google review or a LinkedIn endorsement? Where, and, you know, those things aren't, you know, currency, but they have value and they'll be able to pay dividends in the future. So I think that, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a, a fair amount of determination and perseverance, but uh, you, 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 you got to find ways to get value out of, uh, out of these interactions and relationships, even if it's not necessarily currency. I believe there's another question in here. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so um, how long did it take you to get your firm off the ground? I think you said three months, right? Yeah. It and was a, it was, mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, elaborate. <laughs> was there a little more? Oh, no, I, I was just saying, yeah, it was about three months. Um, what did you wish you knew then that you know now? I would say... I wish I was... I, 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 I would probably go back to the point of experience, which is that, you know, when so many people tell you that you, you can't do something because you don't have enough experience, it's hard to sort of push through that. Um, and, and, and ultimately I did, but it would have been very helpful um, if I had someone tell me that because one of, one of my main beefs with law school, now law school teaches you a lot of things. Beyond the substantive stuff, it's going to teach you a lot of skills, a lot of analytical skills, a lot of problem solving. It, it, I, I think it was the best experience in my life. But there's a few things that are just underrepresented and they don't teach you uh, enough of. And for me, my entire time when I was in law school, uh, I, I don't think there was ever anything about starting your own law firm. They just didn't tell you about it. Um, they didn't tell you practically what you would need to do, what are sort of the challenges, um, you know, how long it might take, things like that. So I, I, I wish that, uh, you, you know, I, not to say anything bad about my alma mater because nothing bad to say about them, but I, I do wish that there were some, some more resources for me back then, which is why I was so excited to do this call. And, you know, anyone on this call who could be tomorrow, next week, it, could be in five years from now if you just say, hey, you were on this call and uh, you might not remember, but I just have some questions about this. I would love to act as, you know, s sort of a resource for anyone who's uh, who's going through this, because I, I, I really don't think that law schools do enough to uh, to teach law students about this. 
That's actually great. Um, actually, Matt, if you don't, wouldn't mind, um, after this call, I usually send out an email to everybody with the recording. If you could give us some links as to some of the resources that you might have used, like through the Florida Bar or whatever, so that they can kind of have some examples of like, what, what were you using to kind of figure out how to get this off the ground? That would be fantastic. Um, we have a few more questions in the chat box here too. Um, so let's see here. Um, Let's see, was immigration your choice of practice right away um, or did you narrow it down to immigration after working in different areas of law? I think you, you had mentioned in law school you had tried a bunch, right? Yeah, I did. How I ultimately came across immigration was a complete, complete fluke. I was out for drinks with a teacher of mine when I was in Toronto and he said, Matt, what do you, you want to do with your life? I said, I, I've changed my mind 10 different times. I don't know. So tell me about yourself. Okay. Told my background, what I've done, what I studied. He said, you should meet this guy. You guys have the same background. I think you would hit it off. That guy ended up being my boss that I mentioned in Toronto. Um, so it was, uh, it was complete fluke, complete chance. And, and I think ultimately the reason that I stuck with it um, was because you really do feel very good helping people out. Uh, with your work if you could find a job where you know yes it's nice to make money yes it's nice to do well but if you're helping people and that can sort of be your driving force um it, it's gonna make the days go by way way easier you're gonna enjoy the work um significantly more so i i ultimately stayed with it for that reason i wanted to um you know, I wanted to enjoy my work and, you know, in, in my own way, be, uh, be of service. Awesome. Adzer, did you have another question too? Oh, yes, I did. Um, so, uh, Matt, when you mentioned that you wrote a book to build your reputation up, I actually thought about doing that, but not for the same reason, because I think I might have to take uh, tons of student loans for law school. So I was wondering how long it took you to pay off your loans, if you took any, if the book helped with the royalties and paying uh, those off? Uh, well, I was very fortunate because I was on a scholarship for law school. So I, I was able to cover, the, you know, the, the other expenses uh, with personal funds. So I was very fortunate in that way. U.S. law schools love Canadians. They, they will give Canadian scholarships. All my Canadian friends um, you know, with, with strong academic backgrounds, we're, we're able to get pretty significant scholarships. So in that regard, I was just lucky. Uh, uh, the royalties for the book um, were not particularly significant. The book, uh, you know, I did make a little bit of money, but not a significant amount. The book was more, one, I learned more than I could ever from, the, the, from immigration by writing the book by basically writing something that's comprehensive about an area of law, it, th there's no better way to learn. Um, so it, it was personally fantastic for me and it was great for my reputation and my credibility, um, but it, 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 it's not the best way to make money if I'm being honest. Thank you, thank you. And I think we'll take one more question. Um, so did you attend the University of Miami because it was geared towards your original interests? Um, or how do you think future law students should choose their school based on your experience? How many uh, law schools did you apply to, by the way? I, so my original plan, I mentioned before, is I wanted to be a sports agent. That was my, my, my young goal. Uh, so what I did is I applied to two different schools. I applied to University of Miami and Tulane. Tulane has a specific sports law program. Uh, Tulane, I got waitlisted, and then I had to make a decision of whether or not I was going to go to Miami or wait for Tulane. Ultimately, I went to Miami, and I think it was the best decision I ever made. Um, but it, I, I wasn't, I didn't go there per, for any, uh, really to study any particular area of law. I, I, I remember this so vividly. It was one of the first few days of uh, orientation. I'm standing in a circle. Must have been 15 other law students around me and, uh, you know, an academic advisor basically going around in a circle asking everyone why they came to University of Miami. 
everyone had these really incredibly inspired answers. I want to be a litigator. I want to be a judge. I want to be in criminal law, family law. They all had real specific passions and goals. And she got to me and she said, Matt, why'd you come to the law school of Miami? I said, because I like the football team. And that was not the answer that she or anyone else was looking for. Uh, so, I, you know, if you, if you are sort of on the other end of, of the spectrum and you have a real passion or area of law, you know, for sure, find, find a school that, that's uh, more geared towards that. Miami was actually more geared to uh, uh, things like sports law and tax law, which ultimately I didn't go into. Um, but it, it, I, I would also say that the, the one point I would make about choosing a law school would be the value in going somewhere uh, that's completely different to where you come from. So I'm born and raised in Montreal and decided to go to law school in Miami. Two wildly different cultures, obviously two different countries, um, and, and just a, a whole new way of life. So culturally, um, it, it's, it's just really good for you to grow as a person to sort of be exposed to something new like that. So my only advice, uh, if you know fiscally it makes sense and, and, you, and you're able to do it, I would say go to somewhere that isn't like where you're from. Just go somewhere different. It's a it's a great opportunity to sort of learn and grow. All right. Well, I think that we're perfectly at one o'clock. So that's look awesome. That. Um, yeah. Look at that. <laughs> that worked out great. Um, well, if anybody else has any more questions for Matt, um, can they connect with you on LinkedIn? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, here, I'll just drop his LinkedIn in the chat box so that you can connect with him. And yeah, if you would send me some of those resources so that when we send out the replay to everybody, we can send out the written material links to them too. Um, that would be fantastic. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And in case you haven't signed up for tomorrow's happy hour, we started doing this virtual happy hour bi-weekly. And it was really, really fun the first time. So I think you guys are really, really going to like it. Um, sign up for tomorrow's happy hour. It's at 4 p.m. Um, and basically, we all jump on Zoom and we spend about 30 minutes kind of meeting everybody on the call. Then we break out into breakout rooms where you're just meeting one person. So you actually get to know somebody and build a real connection. And then we come back into the main room and kind of share our experiences, share information about our new buddies. And it's a really, really great time. It's a really good way for you to meet a whole bunch of new people that you might have never interacted with before. And the first one was a really, really great success. So I really, really want as many people possible to join our second one. So please go and register. Um, if you need the link, just message me on LinkedIn or, um, or reach out to me via email, whichever one, and I will send you the registration link. But thank you so much. And um, Matt, I hope you can join us tomorrow too. Um, Absolutely, I will be there. Awesome, okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and everyone have a wonderful day and I'll see a lot of you tomorrow.